a previous pro episode, I showed you how to build a rack application from scratch. Now the rack gem comes with a number of useful classes, several of which are used within the Rails source code itself, especially when it comes to middleware. Try this out. Go to a Rails application and run the rake middleware command, and then you'll get a list of middleware that is used in this application in development mode. So here's how this works. Every time a request comes in, it's going to go through the first piece of middleware here, and then continue on to the second, and so on, until it reaches your Rails application itself at the very bottom after all of the middleware. Now this is a lot of middleware here, and each one has its own special behavior it adds to the request. So in this episode, I'm going to walk you through each of these so you can get a better idea of what's going on behind the scenes when a request comes in, and hopefully learn a few cool things about Rails and Rack along the way. So let me pass this list here into TextMate so we have a better place to uh, check it off. Now I should mention, this list of middleware is specific to the development environment, so I'll mention the differences in production at the end of this episode. Now the documentation for this middleware is going to be a bit scattered because uh, some of the uh, middleware is defined inside of Rails, some of it's defined inside of the Rack Gem, and elsewhere. Really the best way to find the documentation is just to do a Google search on the, the name of the middleware itself, and sometimes you just have to resort to reading the source code. Well, let's get started on the first one here, Action Dispatch Static. Now there's not a whole lot of documentation on Action Dispatch Static, but its name gives us a big enough hint. It is used to serve static files under the public directory, similar to the Rack static middleware I mentioned in episode 317. If you check out the source code, you can see it simply compares the path to a file, and if it matches, then it's going to uh, serve that file. Otherwise, it's going to continue on to the next middleware. So that's easy enough. We can just say this middleware serves static files under the public directory. Next is Rack Lock. Now, Rack Lock is included in the Rack gem, and the best information I found on the subject is inside of this ticket here, where Ryan Tomeko explains here that it basically locks the app down to a single thread, which is pretty cool because anything higher up in the uh, middleware chain can support multiple threads then. So for example here, rack cache can use multiple threads, but anything after rack lock here will just be locked down to a single thread. In this case, our Rails app. So now we know that rack lock locks the rest of the application down to a single thread. Now, the next one is pretty interesting because it's actually an object here instead of a named class. So uh, it looks like it has something to do with caching. Now this middleware is used internally by rails.cache, and this provides a key value based caching uh, interface where you can write and read keys, based, read uh, cache values based on a given key. You can see there's that value there. Now I explained this more in episode 115. Now by default, rails.cache is going to be a file based store, as you can see there, but it's going to cache the values again internally using a memory based store you can see based on the middleware, um, this is going to cache values in a local store here, and that's going to reset on each request. So this is just a little memory-based store that's used internally by rails.cache. Now I'm not entirely sure why they chose to use an object here instead of just a class in the middleware, maybe for performance reasons, but either way, this uh, middleware is used to flush memory-based store that's used internally by rails.cache. Now the next one, Rack Runtime, is kind of cool. It's something I wasn't really aware of until I researched this middleware. Now this one is also provided by the Rack gem and basically just adds an X runtime header to the response that uh, returns the amount of time it took to process the request. And you can see that if you run the curl command and include the headers on a uh, Rails application, this is going to include X runtime in the response header, which just includes the time it took to process everything after that middleware. So now we know this runtime middleware tells us how many seconds the rest of the app took to process. Next we have Rack Method Override. Now if you go to an edit form in a Rails application and view the HTML source, you may notice that there's this hidden field inside of here called underscore method, which is set to a value like put. And the reason for this is forms in HTML only support the post and git requests. Uh, to get around this, if you want to supply po put or delete requests, you need to pass in an underscore method value and set it to put or delete. And so this is what that rack method override middleware does. It sets the HTTP request method based on the underscore method parameter that's passed in. Next we have action dispatch request ID. 
Now this one is new in Rails 3.2 and basically assigns a unique ID to each request, which you can then use for tracking inside of logs or something. And this is also returned back in the response header. So you can see if we run this curl command on a 3.2 app, you can see that we have this request ID header that includes that unique ID for that given request. So now we know this request ID middleware just assigns a unique ID to each request. Now Rails Rack Logger. This middleware is very simple. It just logs the beginning of a request and then flushes the log afterwards. For example, you can see that uh, in the source code, just adds this line to the log at the beginning of the request and then flushes it after the request is over. So now we know the Rails Rack Logger is used to log the beginning of the request and then flush the log afterwards. Uh, the next two are kind of interesting, show exceptions and debug exceptions. Uh, in originally in Rails 3.1, it was just show exceptions, but debug exceptions was extracted out of it, I guess to make things a little bit more modular in Rails 3.2. But they both help with exceptions, as the name implies. So if your Rails app generates an exception, it's going to be caught by these middleware and uh, generate a pretty error message page like this uh, if you have it configured this way. So these two middleware are used to uh, catch exceptions and display them in a pretty page. Uh, the next we have here is remote IP. Now this one just basically captures the uh, remote IP address and stores it in the request environment for use later on in the application. And it does some spoofing checks and other things in here as well. So that's pretty simple. That remote IP middleware just captures the uh, user IP address. And what about action dispatch reloader? Now this middleware is similar to Rack Reloader that I showed in episode 317. Basically it handles the reloading of classes in development mode. So that's pretty easy. It just reloads classes in development. Now Action Dispatch Callbacks uh, provides a generic callback hook that you can tap into. For example, on the console here, you can call Action Dispatch Callbacks and then call either before or after on this and pass it a block. And this will be triggered on each request. So you can say, uh, uh, before request here, and then we can simulate a request by calling app.get, pass in a path, and then it'll simulate the request and notice this printed out before request here because it actually triggered this block here be through that callback. Now generally you'll stick with controller before filters to do this kind of thing, but if you need it to happen earlier on in a request, you may want to uh, go with this. However, I generally stick with adding a separate uh, piece of middleware for adding some functionality in the request chain like this. So now you know this piece of middleware just adds a simple before and after callback hook. Now we're getting into some active record stuff next. Uh, the first thing we have here is something called connection management. There's not much documentation on this one, but it's pretty simple if you check out the source code. It doesn't do a whole lot more than just clear the active database connections so they don't stick around beyond the request. So that connection management clears the active database connections. Now the next one you can probably tell what it does just by the name, Active Record Query Cache. Now you've probably seen this in your Rails log before. If you perform the same SQL query multiple times in a single request, it's going to cache it and then read from the cache the second time so that it's not going to hit the database every time. So this means it's going to have to reset this cache between requests. And so that's basically what the query cache middleware does. If you check out the source code here, you can see that it ensures that the query cache is cleared at the end of each request. Now the next three pieces of middleware, cookies, session, and flash are all kind of similar. I'm actually going to start with the flash middleware here. Now, as you probably know, flash messages need to persist between requests. And so that's what this middleware handles. It basically uh, stores the flash inside of a session, so it persists between requests, and it uh, sweeps the older flash messages on a request so that they get cleared out as well. So that brings us to the session cookie store middleware, which basically stores the session in a cookie so it persists between requests. And notice that this inherits from rack session cookie, which is included in the rack gem, so you could check that out for more details on how that works. And so the next one up the middleware chain is the action dispatch cookies, which basically stores the cookies in the browser through the uh, set cookie header. You can see the source code is pretty simple for this. It takes the action dispatch cookies and stores them in the uh, response header. So that's basically what these three middleware do. The uh, flash is stored in the session, then the session is stored in a cookie, and then the cookies are set using the set cookie header. So we're getting down to the uh, last few now, only five more to go. Next one is params parser.
You're probably best off browsing the source code for this one. Basically, the params parser uh, accepts parameters in a variety of formats, such as XML, YAML, and JSON. It can parse those into uh, parameters, which are then stored so you can access them later through the params hash. So that params parser basically parses different formatted requests, such as XML and JSON, into the params hash. So next we have action dispatch head. Now this one is a very simple. It just checks to see if the request is a head request, and if so, it's going to convert it to a get request and just call the app and then strip out the body so it just converts it basically into a head request, only setting the header data back to the user. So that means this head middleware just strips out the response body on head requests. So now the next two are sort of related, rack conditional get and etag. Now both of these are provided within the rack gem. I'll start with rack etag first. This basically just sets an etag based on the response body. So this means that if uh, two response bodies are the same, they're going to have the same etag. Now conditional get here will strip out the response body and return 304 not modified if the etag matches. So this means if the response is the same as the last time the user requested it, it's not going to send all of that response data back to the user again. Now there are some other conditions where this applies and there's a bit more to this, but that is something I'll explain more probably in a separate episode. So now we know that etag and conditional get work together to strip out the response body when it hasn't been modified. So there's only one more to go here, best standard support. This piece of middleware is very simple, basically just sets the UA compatible header to IE Edge Chrome 1. So basically what this means, if the user is running Internet Explorer, it's going to try to use the uh, Chrome Frame plugin if that's available. Otherwise, it's going to tell IE to use the latest rendering engine if that's available too. I should mention that if you check out the development config file, there is an option here called Best Standard Support, and here it's going to be set to built-in, but you can change this behavior if you want because it's going to modify uh, how that uh, Best Standard Support works in the middleware. Basically, built-in is not going to use the Chrome Frame uh, plugin. It's just going to do IE Edge. So you may want to change this here. So that's what that Best Standard Support middleware does. It tells IE to uh, use Chrome Frame or the latest rendering engine. And then that falls down to our application. So that's it. That's all of the middleware that's used in Rails in development. Quite a lot that a request goes through behind the scenes here. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are some differences in production. So what are some of the middleware that is used in production that's different in development? So here's a list here. It's actually very similar. To get a better idea of the differences, I'm going to use the diff command here. And I've already put the uh, two separate lists of development and production middleware in their own files so we can see the difference here. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of difference. Uh, in production, there's no action dispatch static, which makes sense because it's not needing to serve the static files through Rails. It can do it through a separate server such as Apache or Nginx. And it does add this rack cache middleware, which I'll show you a bit in a second. And uh, in production, it does not have this action dispatch reloader because it's not needing to reload the classes between requests. Now let's take a look at rack cache. Now rack cache is a Ruby gem that provides support for HTTP caching using the uh, expires and cache control headers and so on. Now this is a big topic in itself, so it's not something I will go into detail here, but probably in a future episode. Well, you made it. That's it for this list of middleware and a default Rails application. Quite a lot going on here, and hopefully you get a better idea of what's going on behind the scenes when a request comes in to a Rails application. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this useful.